Welcome to Stealth Tech News. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Some babies have a face that only a mother could love, but when the mother of this aircraft was the graceful and beautiful F-8 Crusader, what on earth went wrong with the stubby, portly A-7 Corsair II? Comedians would suggest that someone stepped on the blueprints of the Vought A-7, while others have called the aircraft the short, little, ugly fella, a politically acceptable version of its SLUF acronym. Originally, the Corsair II was born of a need for a replacement for the A for Skyhawk. Parent company Vought had long been a supplier of aviation hardware to the U.S. Navy through a long and illustrious line of the Corsair II's forebears, including the original Chance Vought Corsair, which first flew in May 1940. The Corsair II's parent, the F-8 Crusader, it first flew on March 25, 1955, going supersonic on its maiden flight. The F-8 was of its age, it had a slender, area-ruled fuselage and a highly swept wing with variable incidents. This meant the wing could move up and down during low-speed regimes and carrier approach, giving a greater angle of attack and thereby increasing lift without having to belly in for a landing, which would have reduced forward visibility. Following the U.S. Navy's request for proposals, Lingtemco Vought put forward their own design for a replacement for the diminutive Douglas A for Skyhawk in 1963. With one of the main criteria being that the aircraft should be based on an existing design to save costs, Vought's blueprint basically envisaged a scaled-down, shorter, fatter, subsonic homage to the F-8, even if it didn't share any parts with its supersonic parent. Vought won the contract in March 1964, and John Conrad took the first A-7 aloft on September 27, 1965, by which time the aircraft was named the Corsair II, ignoring the fact that Vought had already made two previous Corsairs. By the time the first A-7A Corsair II entered service with the U.S. Navy on February 1, 1967, the program itself had been swift and successful, so much so that the first Corsairs would enter the fray in Vietnam by the end of that same year. Vought's A-7 Corsair II was not a facsimile of the earlier F-8 Crusader, although if you squinted really hard, the two could be the same aircraft. Sure, the A-7 was shorter by around 10 feet, as well as being more rotund and broader but it did have a similarly high-mounted wing, albeit one which was fixed and not of variable incidence. Ground crews would appreciate the fact that the high wing made it easier to load munitions aboard it. At the heart of the A-7 was an economical turbofan engine. In the initial A-7A version, this was a non-afterburning version of the Pratt & Whitney TF-30. The P-6 variant offered 11,350 pounds of thrust leading many to feel this first version of the Corsair II was somewhat underpowered. That said, the range of the first Corsair was ably shown when a pair of A-7s traversed the Atlantic from NAS Patchesant River in Maryland to Evros Airport in France in May 1960, seven to attend that year's Paris Air Show. This unrefueled flight covered 3,327 miles, and broke an unofficial record for a transatlantic flight at the time. Further versions would be powered by a series of improved engines, which delivered more thrust. However, many pilots felt the production A7s never got enough power, even if their maximum speed at sea level and clean was around 690 miles per hour, e at least, according to what it said in the sales brochure. In truth, a fully laden A7 would struggle to hit 500 miles per hour, especially if it was flying in hot and humid weather conditions. As with the Crusader, the A-7A was armed with cannons E-2, not 4, as in the F-8, 20mm Colt MK-12S, with 600 rounds per gun. From the A-7D divided by E version, these would be replaced by a single General M-61, A-1 20mm cannon with up to 1,032 rounds. Again, just like the F-8 E-2 AIM, 9 Sidewinder infrared air-to-air -air missiles could be scabbed to the forward section of the front fuselage on the LAU-7, a launch rails for self-defense, but it was the offensive striking power of the A-7 Corsair II that was more important. Most of the then-current weapons in the U.S. Navy arsenal could be carried by the A-7A. There were six stations on the wing, with the inboard pair often used for carrying fuel tanks. General purpose iron bombs in slick and retarded form could be carried, as well as air to ground missiles and anti radar missiles for the Iron Hand mission against surface to air sites. Compared to the A, for which it was supposed to replace, the Skyhawk was in production until 1979. It was thought that the early model Corsair II could haul the same load twice the distance or double the load the same distance. The new aircraft was relatively easy to maintain, had a duplicated hydraulic system, 
the later a minus 7D divided by E had three systems, for improved survivability, an armored cockpit and sophisticated avionics. In the stubby nose sat the ANAPN-153 radar, with an ANAPQ-116 terrain-following radar set, as well as a radar altimeter and air navigation computer. If there were any issues, it was in the air, due to a lack of available thrust and a tendency to bleed airspeed quickly during maneuvers. On the deck, its low-slung air intake, the F-8 had been nicknamed the Gator for its ability to swallow things, had the propensity to ingest steam from the catapults, resulting in takeoff issues. This fault was later solved by engine updates with compressor stage modifications. That said, it's been reported that the suction from the A-7 on the deck of a carrier had, even at low engine RPM, claimed clothing, a mop and at least one deck handler. Thank you for listening to Flight Tech News don't forget to like and subscribe.